you know, before before I talk about Richard's working with Richard, I, I got two, one story I have to tell you. In 1969, New Year's Eve 68, I'm sorry, New Year's Eve 68, I had been in Chicago for about seven months, eight months. I was working for DuPont, as I, I mentioned. And I pick up the paper. This is this is New Year's Eve, 1968, and it says Richard Pryor at Mr. Kelly's. Now I'm a country boy. I'm thinking, okay, I want to go see Richard Pryor. So I tell my wife, we're going to see Richard Pryor tonight. She says, yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> we dress up, jump in my car, and about nine o'clock, drive down down Chicago. We're living out in the suburbs. It's nine degrees below zero. It is so cold. We get there and trying to find a parking. This is New Year's Eve. Trying to find a parking space in, in on Rush Street at uh, New Year's Eve. It just so happens as we turn, I rode around the block about four or five times. I turned, somebody turned the sign from no, no parking and flipped it to parking. I pulled right in. There was only <laughs> one spot. Someone had gotten sick, I guess, and left. So, man, you're lucky. Boom. First in, I get the spot. I walk over and I see this line going at nine degrees around the block of Mr. Kelly. I'm going, wonder what they're waiting for. <laughs> I go to the front door, I bang on the door, the exit door, and the guy looks at me and I'm banging on the door and now he's a little upset. He says, what? I said, we're here to see Richard Pryor. Now it's about 11 o'clock, 11, yeah, about 11.15. Uh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, about 11 o'clock. And he said, we have no, you, what? He said, he said, who are you? I said, excuse me? He said, he said, come in here. So now he's going to chastise me and berate me. He said, where are you from? I said, Virginia. <laughs> and he said, young man, do you know that these people out there, you see those people out there? They made reservations a year ago. You think you can just walk in off the street and about that time, I mean, he's really getting upset with me. He wants to give me a lesson. They let go of the first show. So now I'm blocking the, the exit of people coming out of the first. He said, stand over here. Now he's mad with me, he pushes me over to the side. All these people, now I'm in there, all these people leave, finally looks at me. He says, oh, stand over there. Now he starts letting people in. He wants me to see that I'm not going to get in here. He lets yeah. everybody in. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm in the warmth the whole time. And at the end of it, he says, now, young man, I'm gonna, obviously you don't know. Two people got in an argument at the bar. The woman threw a drink. I could hear it. We could see it in the door. Threw a drink in the man's face, smacked him, got up and walked out. And he's running out of baby, 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 and they leave. And the guy said, you coming back? He said, no, what the hell with this? And he looked at me, he says, there are two seats at the bar, go in. in. <laughs> True story. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so we go and we sit at the bar, show starts. And just before um, uh, midnight, Richard Pryor comes out and performs. It, it was just breathtaking. He was so funny, so powerful. And he was so open and, and I just, I can't even explain. And I'm look, looking at him, I look at my wife and I said, I want to do that. And I want to do it on that stage on New Year's Eve. Boom. In 1975, um, Mr. Kelly shut his doors. And New Year's Eve on 1975, the last comic to work Mr. Kelly was me. Uh, wow. solo. And, and I say that to say that people have to be careful of what they ask for. They got to really be very specific. And that specific gift was given to me. Now, um, flash forward to performing in uh, 76, I think it was in, in uh, a year or so later, uh, I'm in LA struggling, trying to make it as a single uh, stand up. And Paul Mooney, who passed away yesterday, yeah. um, May 19th, um, and I were friends and we were all struggling together. We were working in the comedy store after the late night shift at the comedy store, myself, John Witherspoon. And he called and said, guys, uh, Rich has got a new show. He wants me to put together a comedy troupe. I want you guys to come. And we all, Robin Williams, John Williams, myself and Marshall Warfield and many others went over and became his sort of comedy troupe. And uh, it's an experience that there should be movies about it. It was one of the most fascinating experiences. Uh, the ups and downs of that. We did four episodes, you know. And uh, there's nothing been like it on television since, to say the least. So that's did my Richard Pryor story. 
Did you guys all contribute material or how did the, the sketches oh, yeah. and the writing come together? There was, <laughs> knowing, you know, you have to, Richard being a master uh, storyteller, got his juice from the response from people. So his idea was if he brought a lot of comics, young comics that he had seen at the store, who worked the comedy store around him, that we would then begin to improv. And out of that, he would be inspired and would inspire us. And that's what happened. There would be, yeah, there, there were no script. There was, what there were was a scene. They would say, all right, here's the scene. We're gonna do the Star Wars bar. And in this room are all the costumes that we were, we were given by Spielberg and all those people. You go in there and pick one. I mean, George Lucas. Uh, uh, so we'd run in the room and grab, and, you know, not fight over it, but everybody get, and we pick our own costumes. And they said, okay, here is the bar, action. <laughs> and Richard would walk in and it would happen. It would be so organic. It would be, uh, we did one that I see on the internet quite a bit now, the first black president, completely organic. We just said, okay, what's the sketch today? It's the first black president. Go in wardrobe. Sometime we go down to Western costuming. Pick out your outfit. I decided because of my civil rights activity. I said, I'm going to get a black beret. I'm going to get an army jacket. I'm going to be that militant, militant brother. You know, Spoon had a suit. He was, a, you know, a guy. He was really dressed, well dressed. And so we all went in this room. Uh, Marsha Warfield decided she's going to be a reporter. And, and, and Richard came in. Everything after that happened. It was organic. Uh, many of the show, many of uh, the episodes we did could not be uh, shown on television because they were a little, <laughs> a little too far over the edge. But um, we had so much fun. We had it was it was a creative experience that I think all of us, uh, whenever we would meet Robin Williams or whoever we'd meet, we all smile and we knew that we had gone through boot camp. It was rare. The red to have that kind of freedom and we would hang out with richard at his house on he would have events i'm not events so, uh, pool parties and he'd invite us all over and um i think it was once every sunday or saturday after we rehearsed we'd all go over there we went through the shooting the car together we went through his wedding the surprise wedding we thought he was marrying someone else As a matter of fact the person name on the cake was not the person he married that's how everybody was fooled <laughs> so it was, uh, there should be a movie. There should be books written about uh, the experience. You know, Absolutely. so many of us now are passing, but um, it'll never leave my, my consciousness, that's for sure.